But it was a couple, many years ago, we were sitting at the table. <laughs> he said, uh, there's more than one way. And I thought maybe my hearing aid was messing up. I said, what'd you say? He said, yeah, there's other religions. I said, I said well, you look. Well, he was in a position I wasn't able to talk, say too much. But I just said, well, the Bible says that Jesus is the way. And that's a definite article, which means there's no other way. And it's the exclusions of all the other possible ways. And so he is the way. Um, there is no other way. And we are Eric, we can be, we can exercise a little arrogance about Christianity. Because if Christianity is true, everybody else is wrong. Yep, yeah, because it, we say, we believe that. Jesus is the way, and if you have another way besides that, then that has to be wrong because it doesn't line up with Scripture. Okay. All right. So, as I said a couple of weeks, a week, last week, the, the process of studying about Christology, we're going to look at some Scriptures, and we're going to walk through Scripture. Um, it might be painstaking, but it, it's necessary. So y'all bear with me. Help me to do a good job at teaching. So slow, slow me down. I don't understand. You miss some. I, whatever you need, help me to do well so that we can all walk away with understanding. Okay, so we're going to look at four basic scriptures over the next four or five weeks. And... What I have here is John. You have all the scriptures. Y'all, if, if you're writing, don't write. Uh, unless you want some sp specific notes. The stuff that I'm putting up here, I can give it to pastor. He can screen it, and he can put it on the, the website. Okay? Now, if you, okay. Okay. I, yeah, that one is already up there. Okay. So, um... You, do you have it? Okay, I'll tell you what. No, 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 no. Pass, 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 pass. I got something for it because I ain't using it. Just scroll up. So, so we call these the four great Christological texts. And uh, as you can see, there's John, John, Philippians, Colossians, and Hebrews. John, Philippians, Colossians, and Hebrews. We're going to extract from those four texts all we need to know about Jesus Christ. Okay? Trust me. And the dates are important, but on an academic level. Um, location, uh, Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, and Chalcedon. There were other, they call these incumenical councils. Incumenical means worldly. So there are people, great minds, theologians. Of course, they didn't call themselves theologians back then. But they would come together, discuss things, and see what, how we understand God's word. And Paul was even a part of the, the, um, the Council of Jerusalem. Um, so, so that's, and, then, and there are other incumbental councils, but these are four, in, four important ones. So, um, and I also have the contender. There was a main, that was a, a, a main, a central figure that was prominent in these particular councils. Either they had the wrong understanding of Jesus, and all of these did, but, it, but the ones that were right, they're not mentioned, but... We want to look at what they did wrong so that we won't fall into that same situation there. And, and here are the conclusions that the, of each council, okay? Um, for, for example, this one, the Aries, um, they decided that Jesus was fully God, is fully God. And again, they had these challenges as far, as far back as 325 A.D., I remember when I was in seminary, the, the professor said, you have to know these by heart. If you don't, when, you, when your name is called to get your diploma and you can't answer, we're going to retract your diploma. Of course, he didn't do that. 
But then that's been so long, I don't remember that stuff. But I had to remember I was all that stuff. So, um, so like I say, Aries, he said, uh, you know, he was having a problem with Jesus being fully God. And as a result of this council, they say he is fully God. And then I'll come down here, uh, Philippians, Constantinople, um, Air, uh, Polinaries, and he says he's fully man too because they, they, were, they were saying that uh, he's an aberration. He's really God. He, he got, he's not a man because uh, he did some things that just didn't make sense for a man. So they concluded that he was fully man. And then, of course, uh, Colossians and Ephesus and Astorius, uh, he had two natures. How revolutionary is that? Um, joined. Indivisible. Just like we have three parts of our existence. Did y'all know that? We have three parts. Trichotomy. We are flesh, we are spirit, and we are soulish. Battles in Genesis, it says that uh, God, I'm sorry, and soul. I say soulish. Uh, the Bible says that um, that God made man with dirt, mold, fashion him. And that's where you get Adam from. Adam in, in Hebrew means dirt, earth dirt. And he said he fashioned him up into a little figure, a silhouette, whatever you want to call it. And then he said that God breathed into his nostrils. And he became a living soul. So we, we have three indivisible joined components of our existence. And let me tell you how they, how they really, we know they really joined. Sometimes you could be physically sick, but your soul feels, ugh. Or you could be troubled and worried, and you could be in good health, but your, the unseen part of you is not functioning properly because they, they connected. And that's what we talk about holistic ministry. You want to address all three parts of your existence, okay? Any questions about what I said, all that extra stuff? Yeah, yeah, we'll do with this. Any questions? Okay, so... Okay. So next slide, we're going to look at John 1, 1 through 18, the center of Lagos Christianity. Now that word, that phrase might throw you off, but think about it. John 1, 1 through 18, it talks about in the beginning was the word, the Lagos, and the word was God, the word was with God. So, so this idea of Lagos Christology deals with John because his use of the word. W-O-R-D in our English language is L-O-G-O-S and the transliteration of the Greek language. Lama, Omega, Gamma, Omega, Sigma, something like that. Anyway, so that's what we're talking about. So we're going to, remember I said earlier, we're going to look at four texts, and we're going we're gonna to fashion a Christology, an understanding of Jesus. So this is a precursor of what we're going to talk about shortly. So let's look at what John 1, 1 through 18 affirms, or what it talks about. First of all, it affirms that Christ's deity, okay? Uh, you can find that in, in John. And we're going to look at specific passages uh, in the upcoming days or weeks. He is the Logos, the re revelation and the communicator. Those little numbers over there indicate the, the particular uh, scripture uh, verse. Verse. So um, do your due diligence as a Christian um, when you get home. Uh, if, well, some of you are home. When you get a chance, look up these passages so that God could speak through his word and not just what Minister Carter is saying. Okay, so he is the Lagos, he's the revelation, and, and that's an interesting word. It's an interesting word because in Greek 
Um, philosophy, that's, it was, they were influenced by Greek philosophers. When they used word, that, it went far beyond what we, what we perceive. It's not necessarily what comes out of my mouth with some voice, but it has to do with the thought of God. And you think about it. Does God really have to say, let that be light? And who's he talking to? What language he might be using? The thought, like Cain. So it goes beyond the verbal communication to the thought process. So that's, the, um, that's extra two. Um, he is life and salvation um, and creation. Um, and so let me go through these because I can read that. He's, um, he's light. It presents Christ in coordination, trying uh, to tie together deity and humanity. All of this you can find in John 1, 1 through 18. Uh, it emphasizes Christ's unique relationship with the Father. He is the revealer of the Father. He is the mediator to the Father. That's his ongoing ministry now. He's on the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. It provides content for the development of the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, essential oneness of the Father and the Son, that's very important, and the distinctiveness of the person within the Godhead. Okay? Any questions about, about any of that? And it's just an overview of what we're going to dissect in the upcoming, that's coming up. I don't know if it's in this presentation, but we'll see. I was hoping that we can get through John, but we're not. Any questions? Okay. All right, here we go. That's uh, passages that we're going to talk about. And I'll use the New King James Bible. And by the way, let me say a word on that. There are three different types of categories of translation. You have the interlingual, the the interlinear uh, translations, you have the dynamic equivalents, and then you have the paraphrase. Uh, interlinear would be the original language, the Greek, Hebrew, or the Aramaic. The Bible consists of three languages, not two, three. Because there are uh, brief Aramaic in Daniel and some other chapter. And then, of course, the New Old Testament is Hebrew, New Testament is Greek. So, in it, that's what interlinear is. Dynamic equivalence is the King James, the RSV, NSV, um, NIV. Uh, all of those in the scale of dynamic equivalence was so pretty close translation to the original language. Then you got the paraphrase. Now, the real caution is be careful how you use those paraphrases. For example, the Living Bible, MacArthur Bible. Help me out, Pastor. I don't know, man. Yes. Some of those, those, are, those Bibles are basically paraphrases with somebody else's interpretation. Any, any translation is interpretation, but when you get to that paraphrase, they are just telling you what to believe and what to think. Now, sometimes it's okay to refer to them for clarity, but don't use them to, as a study Bible. Use one of the NIV, King James, even though it's archaic, written back in 16... 11, uh, authorized by King James, not written by King James. Thank God he didn't write it. Because that, 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 that dude had some challenges. Uh, but he was smart, 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 smart. So find a translation that probably dynamic equivalents, RSV, NIV, um, KJV, um, the, the CSB, Christian Standard Bible, even the English translation uh, all of those are good dynamic equivalent category, categorical Bibles. So um, do get something that you can read. King James is written in old English, uh, archaic. We don't talk like that. And it throws some people off. Okay, get something that you can read. Today's translation, the, the, the Christian, the Holman, all of those are great Bibles. One day we'll do a, um, a study on, on different types of Bibles, translations, right? That's to say, yeah. Okay, so um, that's the scripture that we're going to look at. 
Okay. So the first verse, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We're going to look at that. We're going to dissect that a little bit. So, don't be afraid of that little crazy, <laughs> that little crazy stuff at the bottom. That's all right. We're going we're gonna to work on that. Okay. So, in, okay, and, ho, lagas, ka, ho, lagas, in, pros, tone, theon, ka, theos, en, o, logos. What I just said is this in Greek. So we have in, in beginning was the word, and the word was with the God. They put tone in there just to make sure the subject stays right. We don't use it because we, we feel like we don't need it in English. And God was the word. That's what it says in the original language. In which category would that, would that, that passage come which category of translations would that come under? Interlinear. Interlinear. Interlinear is the original language. Okay? All right. Yes, sir. They want, they want you to do, they want you to say that over again because the audience at home might not hear you. Okay, in that first verse, in the beginning, what does beginning mean? It said, in the beginning was the word. How far back does beginning go? That's a good question. Fair question, too. We're going to address that in our, we call this um, exegesis. We're going to exegete that passage, that first couple, that first verse. And notice, there's no the bit in here. It reads, in beginning, there's no the. We put a the in there to help us with our, our readability and to give some emphasis on the subject. But um, we're going we to find out why that is the case in the original language. Okay, any, any other questions about that? We're going to... That passage of scripture will be um, both of them, the, the interlinear translation and the um, King James translation, rather the New King James translation will be on the next couple of slides uh, as we work in our understanding of Christology. Yeah, if y'all have questions at home, um, I guess the pastor, you can email the pastor. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you, I, I, I want to make sure. No, that, I, it is it's ordered. I, I, if you give me the, the, um, the right to receive emails, I will. I will. They can email me. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, okay, in the beginning. Here's some of the things that we can extract from that passage. And the first is the nature of the word, uh, 1 to 5. He is divine in his persons. Three aspects of his nature. Okay, we got that. He is divine in his persons. In the beginning, it was the word and the word was God. Because the word was God. So that means he's divine in his nature. And here's three aspects of that, Okay. His pre-existence, well, um, Brother Johnson was asking the question, uh, in the beginning was the word. In is imperfect, which means you don't know. There is, the, 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 the point it's making, there was no starting point. But in order for us to conceptualize what we are trying to talk about, we use the word beginning. But the word itself, is in, the verb is imperfect. There is no starting point of Jesus. Well, we, we learned we learn less. <laughs> hey, but listen, listen, brother. We all say it. 
But it, as long as we really, I, I can't, I can't, I can't say it's, it's, it's a best practice to, to, to always speak in a way that it's, it lines up with scripture. But when we say Jesus, because it, 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 it would be painful to hear, and I know he was, I knew he was having some contrition last week, uh, that it was actually the beginning point of Jesus. But we understand that because in the beginning was word and, and the word became flesh. So, but there is no beginning point with Christ. I, I see you, you have it. that look on your face with that sit, the lady sitting behind you. Okay, so, so we talked about his dual nature a couple of slides ago. Nobody had any questions about it. Now we're going to look at what that, what that means. If I should, might want to ask a question. You would like to ask a question? It's okay. I was just wondering, would it be correct to assume from that that uh, in the beginning? Oh, okay. I'm just hard of hearing, man. You, oh, you, okay. You're doing good. Pastor's going to tell me what you said about it. In the beginning, Jesus already was. Yes, 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 yes. And then also there might be that aspect that uh, the triune God, God lives and exists outside of time. And uh, it could be referred to uh, in the beginning of time, the Godhead already existed. Time is we know it, but God exists outside of time. You are, that's, that's just something I was questioning, asking a question about. Okay. Okay, see how I lapsed into agreeing without really, because it's just kind of um, destroying what I've been trying to teach. Okay. Let's, let's address time for a second, because I think that's what's hanging us up. Um, I took algebra and passed the probably couldn't test. Uh, negative infinity, positive infinity, um, no, no ending points either way. There's a way for us to represent that by that symbol, but we can't draw a line that doesn't stop somewhere. So imagine this was an in infinite pew. I mean, the backside was infinite. It went forever that way and forever that way. So there's no end in it either way. You got that? Okay. Well, somewhere around here, it's got this thing called time. You got that? Okay. That's just a stopping point. That doesn't has that doesn't have anything to do with the eternality of this bench. It's just a point here, and it's called time. One day. Time will be, will be wiped away. It, will, it wouldn't exist anymore. So if we can imagine taking time out, that's when God is. He's not a part or function of time. Therefore, he has no beginning and no ending. But in the English, I'm trying to understand and grasp that. We have to put the word beginning, but there is no beginning. That's why that word is imperfect in the, in the original language. We don't know. It's, it's eternal. Did I help you? And then we talked about Jesus. We divided the subject matter into his persons and uh, his deity. We talked about that. That was a specific time when Jesus came into existence. Namely, in Bethlehem, he was born of Mary, announced by the Spirit. This God, who has no beginning, revealed himself in flesh, which is called the incarnation. He has two natures. He's deity and he's person. 
There is no beginning or ending to his deity. But there was a beginning to his humanity. All right? Okay. But guess what? Now he forever dwells as the son of God. In some kind of human, human flesh. It's not like ours because they say that they can see him. They say, don't touch me. Uh, he had some kind of digestive system. He had a meal. So the Bible tells us that one day we will see him as he is, and we will be like him. Okay. I'm not, I'm not standing here to make sure everybody agrees with me. I want to, if you have a different understanding, um, your, your opinion it's, it's important for us to even clarify why they had all of these people at these incremental councils, because they didn't understand. This is not something easy to understand. It, it all boils down to a faith walk, a faith gesture. For me to explain how God can dwell in humanity and then down across, and be, I cannot do that. I can only tell you what is written in his word. And a part of that is it's, it's a faith walk in understanding. Uh, it's faith seeking understanding. I forget who that is. I might be Aslam of Canterbury. But we're trying to understand this thing that we call faith. It, we don't need full comprehension to have faith, but we do need faith that's seeking understanding. Because it's by our faith we are saved. Not what we understand. When I, when I read this scripture, um, when we talk about King James uh, authorizing the Bible, it, it's almost like they had to, their interpretation was you had to have a starting point. But what we need to understand that there is no starting point with God. Um, in the beginning for us would be my, the year I was born, the month I was born, the date I was born. But that, that does not correlate with God because he always, he always existed. So I think when you, when people read in the beginning was the word, they're trying to conceptualize a, a starting point. There is no starting point whatsoever. Um, but what it's, again, what it's trying to get you to understand that long before this earth, this world, us was God. And that's, that's what I think about when I read it. So. Very good. Anybody else want to share? As you can see, that word is imperfect. Uh, that verb is imperfect. And it denotes uh, um, the idea of no idea of origin, but simply continuous existence. Uh, Robinson, he was a theologian, and he commented on that. It's on page three in his book, whoever that is or wherever that is. But um, um, so, so that's it. he has no beginning point. But the man, Jesus, and the incarnate son of God does. Okay, so the three aspects of his nature, um, first one is his preexistent. And that's the, I think, I think if they would have used that word, it, it would be much easier to understand it, uh, much easier to understand. But you have what we have. Uh, he's co-equal. Uh, he's co-eternal. He's co-existent. And he's uh, uh, consubstantial. So co-existent. This would be co, not con. Co-substantial. And that we get the word interpenetration. I think I have a diagram that will help you understand what I mean by interpenetration. They say, what's well, it? Said, oh, uh, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I'm going to stop there. Any questions? Sorry. I, 
I don't own copyright for that. Might be copyright. I don't know. Pastor, I'm done for tonight. Any questions? Thank you so much. When you're having fun, right? <laughs> yes, it does. It flies when you're having fun. But are you learning something? Oh, my goodness. Yes. The thing is, spread.